hi again, folks. I'm Prashant. I'm a PM on the BizTalk team. Um, I'm going to talk here about how, uh, with the new app service platform, uh, you're now able to do the same scenarios that you were able to do with BizTalk services and the expanded form uh, that we just released uh, you know, uh, two, three weeks back. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you saw a bit of a teaser like a couple of hours ago where uh, I demoed the uh, EI order processing scenario, uh, XML coming in, you get it validated, uh, and then process a rule to apply a discount and push it off to a destination. Uh, I'm going to expand on that scenario and uh, talk to that uh, to kind of showcase the capabilities of how uh, on app services we are able to do more than uh, what was just available with BizTalk services earlier. Um, so before I kind of uh, get to exactly expanding that scenario, um, I'm going to do a quick recap on uh, the uh, Azure BizTalk services that's already out there, right? So uh, we have this platform go out, uh, was it a couple of years back? Um, it was a managed service. Uh, it was a managed service uh, out there, which means that you can just go provision it uh, really quickly uh, in the cloud in Azure, uh, have your energies focused on managing uh, the integration specific aspects of it, like TBM and tracking and uh, so on and so forth, but not having to worry about the infrastructure so much so. Um, and uh, it was a configuration driven approach to um, to integration. So uh, essentially what you had was uh, a UI based uh, service where you can go configure the sources, your destinations, and how you want to go uh, do the message mediation in between and then route it to a particular uh, location, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, on top of it, it was a dedicated deployment that was deployed for you in Azure um, on, a, on a dedicated piece of hardware, which meant that it could be easily uh, scaled up uh, backed up uh, in an isolation, and uh, it kind of uh, lends well to large volume workloads, right? Uh, uh, after being all this, it was also uh, an extensible platform uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, the uh, TPM part, uh, which was one of the centerpieces that you had uh, a separate portal to go manage trading partners and everything. Uh, you could also, you also had an OM API for that, so you could go create your own partners and uh, agreements and so on and so forth using the API or develop your own tooling on top of it. Uh, besides that, there was uh, some capability of uh, the messaging pipeline itself being extensible uh, using message inspectors uh, if you are familiar with the service, right? Um, so let's take a look at that one in a little more detail. The centerpiece of the configuration-based uh, model of MAPS was a bridge. Uh, bridge was really just an encapsulation of a bunch of things, right? Uh, you had uh, sources that you could connect to from where you pull the data. And then uh, you could uh, basically put it into a pipeline with multiple uh, typical uh, XML mediation steps, right, uh, that you would have been used to with even the BizTalk server. Um, so you could do a validation, transformation, enriching that particular message, uh, and then, you know, do routing at the end to a bunch of the destinations that the bridge supported. Um, while this worked great for a lot of our customers, uh, we had uh, several customers pick it up and deploy it in production. Even Microsoft IT is running like a uh, pretty large workload on uh, B2B for this, uh, on, on this particular version of the release. Um, there was a bunch of stuff that we uh, heard back from customers as well, right? Um, the first and the most obvious one was that the places where enterprises need to pick their data from is now exploding. Uh, it's like exponentially more than what it's traditionally been. You have data in legacy systems, you have it in SQL and Oracle, and uh, you know now, in fact, uh, data in uh, SaaS applications and social media and so on and so forth that you want to be able to connect to uh, and also be able to send kind of data to these guys, right? Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, <clears throat> pipeline itself uh, we had a few uh, pre-baked templates that we shipped. Uh, there were bridges for uh, EDI mediation. And then there was uh, the XML one-way and two-way pipelines that you could use to uh, take an XML, uh, validate, transform, and so on and so forth with it, right? Um, and that needed extensibility in like a couple of ways. You may want to go build your own pipeline uh, where besides using the out-of-box components for message mediation, you want to do, say, something like a PGP encryption or decryption in the middle, right, which we don't support out of the box. Uh, or you want to do some custom compression out there. And then you want to go you reuse that particular pipeline in multiple scenarios. Um, 
or uh, you want to go uh, insert a really specific piece of custom code uh, or logic that's available to you uh, for your particular scenario and not necessarily have it um, you know, uh, templatized, right? So uh, while we had like a, uh, this was fairly limited with the first release of the product, right? Um, and beyond of this, uh, I think we kind of realized that beyond this messaging that can take data from one place and put it to the other, uh, integration scenarios really need more. Uh, you want to be able to do such multiple such mediations with different sources and destinations and kind of go put in your own uh, uh, workflow logic in between with parallel executions and conditionals, long running workflows and whatnot, right? Um, and have various uh, typical workflow and integration patterns show up as a part of your end to end uh, integration solution. So, um, you know, there's been a good talk, a couple of good talks already, uh, the introduction to uh, the app services platform and how Logic Apps kind of lets you build and orchestrate APIs uh, in the cloud. Um, so this is how we kind of arrived at uh, where we are going with this talk, uh, services going forward, right? Um, you've already heard about API apps and Logic Apps as one, two of the key pieces uh, that are out there uh, in uh, Azure App Services. And these provide a great platform for us to kind of go build on top of it, right? Uh, for instance, uh, API Apps is, a, is an excellent uh, platform for us to go build uh, connectors to various pieces like SaaS and enterprise and hybrid. Uh, it's an, um, it also lends itself very well to uh, you know, building pipeline components. That's what we are doing and that's what we hope uh, you guys would be able to do. Uh, and that's the extensibility piece, uh, you know, with uh, the, the programming model becoming uh, pretty much just web API that you go write in Visual Studio. Uh, Samir's going to uh, come up and talk later about how you can go build connectors. Uh, but you're not necessarily limited to just connectors. You can go build any kind of a web, a web API app that can plug into your into an orchestration or workflow uh, as a part of this, right? Um, uh, along with that, uh, the Logic Apps piece provides us the much needed orchestrations that were missing uh, from the first version of the service. And um, you could use the Logic Apps to either do end-to-end -end orchestrations, like the ones that we will demo, uh, or you know, uh, pre-build just a pipeline that you needed to do mediation of data that's kind of relevant to you and have that uh, reused in multiple places. Uh, in addition to that, you've probably seen some of the debugging and the uh, tracking uh, pieces of Logic Apps already. Uh, so that provides uh, all of the key pieces that we need uh, to get started with a more uh, complete integration platform uh, in the cloud. So a uh, bunch of talk, uh, I guess. Uh, things work, work better with demos. Uh, and I'm going to just switch back into a demo. Uh, it's an expanded scenario of what uh, you, know, you guys saw a brief preview of uh, a couple of hours ago. Um, I'm going to take. Uh, data received on Edifax. So this is probably what you know. Somebody from your business came and draw, drew on a whiteboard and saying, "This is what I want to go achieve, right?" Um, and so I want to go take data from Edifax and uh, get it over AS2, uh, apply a discount policy on top of it, and then go push it into SQL. And then, as you guys saw last time, uh, we check the value of the order and send an email uh, to the sales manager as well, right? Um, so while that's that's a nice. Uh, uh, compact view of how uh, how somebody would draw it on a whiteboard. Uh, when we actually look at it, it's really a couple of things that you want to go do. I would, um, being developers, I would actually come, uh, you know, we'd start thinking about how do I componentize this and do my receive separately and then have my logic that does the uh, actual execution of the, uh, the, the, the order processing separately, right? So um, <clears throat> what you want to do is really uh, take um, received it over AS2, that gives you a raw EDI order in this particular example. Um, you want to be able to convert it to XML so that you can go do, do stuff with it uh, and not just have to work with flat files. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, basically go invoke whatever uh, other workflows that you had along with it, right? So uh, the first part kind of encapsulated nicely into an EDI inbound processing logic app that I'm going to talk about. Um, and the second part is the order processing flow that you guys have already seen. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through these flows and uh, talk about the components and how these get configured uh, in Azure, right? Um, so that's really what you want to do. So I'm just going to switch to the portal um, and show you the two apps I have. 
All right, so uh, you guys have already seen the, uh, the order processing app. So I'm gonna open the EDI inbound app. Let's take a look at this. All right, so um, this particular app, uh, as you can see, uses an AS2 connector to trigger the flow. So that means whenever your partner sends you a message uh, on that particular endpoint, uh, it's going to trigger the flow, it's gonna receive and decode, uh, and give you a decoded AS2 message. Um, that's no good because you need to kind of now parse the actual uh, payload that's coming in. So we've taken the functionality that was there in uh, BizTalk services with Edifact support and wrapped it into an API app that you can use in a flow directly, right? So uh, this is the same, uh, <clears throat> this is the same uh, 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 code that's running at the back end that was working on uh, 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 Bistock services, and uh, what the uh, Edifact shape does is it takes in the raw, uh, you know, flat file payload and produces four arrays for you guys. Uh, one is the valid messages because you know you might have a bunch of messages in the interchange, so it's done a disassembly for you, uh, put it together in an array. Uh, any messages that didn't parse correctly uh, or parse didn't par parse correctly go into the invalid messages array that you can go and you know, as you can see. Uh, we are gonna upload that to a blob, so that that's like a suspended store for your message that didn't parse. Uh, and any generated and received acts uh, out of Edifact also kind of uh, become available as arrays. Um, what the shape uh, gives out is XML. Um, so you can now use the traditional BizTalk components on top of it. Uh, so what I'm doing here is taking the large Edifact XML that gets generated out of this and transforming it to uh, the internal XML that we used earlier today, and then posting it to the endpoint uh, of the uh, order processing application, right? So uh, let's see this in action, and I'm gonna switch to the browse to post mine out here, right? So um, how many guys read Edifact here? Wow. Well, you guys don't really need <laughs> BizTalk doing this for you, but yeah, so what we're doing here is uh, taking that flat file message, uh, you know, it's going from uh, a receiver to a sender, it's got one single order encoded into it, uh, and we're gonna just post it uh, using Postman to, uh, to, the, to the workflow that we have. Um, I've configured to get back an MDN, which is empty, so you just get back 200 uh, from the service out here, right? Let's switch back to the portal and uh, find the application again and see what happened with that. All right, so that's the run that just happened uh, based on the trigger I did. Uh, it was received and uh, then uh, you know it went through the EDI uh, Edifact service. Uh, to be disassembled, and that seems to have succeeded. Um, and then uh, it got transformed and posted to, uh, to an HTTP endpoint. Um, let's uh, look at the flow in a little more detail. Um, let's look at the inputs of this thing. Uh, so as you can see, the, the uh, AS2 message uh, was, uh, the AS2 decode was pretty much a pass-through because I'm not using any uh, encryption on AS2 uh, right now. Uh, so that we can look at the message. Uh, but uh, after the AS2 decode, that's the message that got passed on to the service. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one, wh what the service does uh, is basically convert that flat file into the XML format uh, that you have uh, for, for the Edifact. So um, this is pretty much the same functionality that you could use uh, with BizTalk services earlier, and now you have it available in Azure services, right? So uh, from a B2B standpoint, uh, we have four API apps that are out there. I'm gonna talk about these in a little more detail. Uh, the, uh, the central piece uh, of everything is a trading partner management API app. Um, and uh, the other three API apps that actually do the heavy lifting um, of the work uh, are the AS2, X12, and Edifact that we ship out of the box. A TPM uh, API app is there for you to manage your agreements and partners, as you might uh, expect. 
Um, and uh, you can also use it to kind of store any schemas and artifacts that uh, are relevant to your message mediation from B2B standpoint. Uh, uh, what the AS2 does is basically, it looks up the headers uh, of the AS2 message and then resolves which agreement uh, would uh, apply to that particular uh, incoming AS2 message and performs and decode uh, and can basically perform and uh, decode and encode uh, of that particular message uh, based on how your agreement's configured. Uh, similarly, the Edifact and X12 uh, look up the, uh, par parse the headers of the payload that was passed them, uh, figure out the sender and uh, receiver, and then look up the agreement based on that. And uh, then they can disassemble and decode the message or encode the message if you had uh, and batch it out uh, to send it out, right? Um, when we look at these particular uh, API apps on the portal, um, let's first pick the trading partner management service, right? So um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of information uh, that you can see for every API app out there. Uh, that's fairly standard in terms of what are the, uh, what's the resource group it belongs to, what's the host on which it's running, uh, and uh, what's the uh, location of that particular API app. And in addition to that, uh, you know, for things like uh, trading partner management, we have uh, the partners and agreements and certificates and schemas uh, that show up as uh, links out here, right? Um, so, uh, and then it's the familiar experience of going and creating partners and uh, agreements. Uh, so I've got two, two, uh, two partners configured here, Contoso, and uh, Northwind, and uh, when I can look at the Contoso profile, and I can see the identities that are configured with Contoso are the AS2 identity is Contoso, and uh, the, uh, uh, the EDI identity is, uh, is mutually defined with, uh, with a number that I picked for the demo, right? So um, similarly, uh, there's the Northwind partner defined, and once you've defined your partners, you can actually go and create an agreement between these two partners. So uh, as you would expect, I have two agreements out there right now. Uh, one is for the AS2 processing uh, between Condoso and Northwind, and one is for the Edifact processing between Condoso and Northwind. And uh, you can look into uh, each one of these and uh, figure out your typical receive settings and send settings uh, that would be of interest. So uh, there you see, uh, for AS2, you would have all of the typical uh, AS2 configuration parameters, whether you want to send an MDN, uh, what's the text of the MDN, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> and let me just duplicate this so that Right, and if you look at the Edifact agreement, uh, you would similarly see uh, the settings for partners uh, that the agreement involves. Uh, how do you want to receive the data and how do you want to uh, send it out, uh, the various configuration settings for uh, batching it as well. So uh, looking into the receive settings, uh, I've got uh, an order schema uh, that's configured and that's the order that I sent in and that got parsed. So um, that's the key part about uh, the B2B API apps where uh, you know, trading partner management is central to keeping your agreements and partners while the, uh, while the other services kind of depend on the trading partner management service to retrieve the agreements information based on the protocol data that they get uh, and then actually perform the encode or the decode. Um, moving on, um, you know, uh, in the demo we saw earlier today, uh, there, was <clears throat> there was a bunch of XML processing uh, components that we were using. Uh, so these are the same uh, from a core perspective as what we, were, uh, what we had available uh, in BizTalk services uh, that were able to do validation and transform uh, of, the, um, of the incoming XML messages. Uh, we also have ability to deal with flat file data uh, using schemas and you can convert the flat file data to XML and back uh, for doing the actual processing. Um, besides the XPath extractor that we saw in the morning that was able to 
pull out data from the XML, and then you can use it in the logic app, right? So uh, let's look at these pieces in the portal. So I have my XML validator out here uh, that basically uh, per uh, participates in my uh, order processing flow. And uh, well, it should have. Yep. So, uh, and you can see that it has got my uh, rule input schema configured. It's just loading. Um, and uh, basically, any XSD you can go put in there, and uh, you can use it to validate against uh, the data that's coming in. Similarly, I've got the transform service. Um, the transform service is currently configured uh, with a TRFM file uh, that is built with the same SDK tooling that you have for BizTalk services. So, uh, you know, if you've got, if you're familiar with it, you can go build your TRFMs using the SDK tooling that we have and have those maps kind of get uploaded here. Uh, and then you can use these uh, as a part of your flow. So, uh, what their transform service does is uh, when, it, when, a, when an XML message comes in, it will run through the set of maps that it has, sees which one is applicable, and then perform the actual transform and send out the data, right? Uh, of course, if none of the maps match, uh, it's going to error out and say that I got invalid data uh, or unexpected data. But you can use the same uh, transform service or the validate service to validate different kinds of schemas, different kinds of maps, uh, and run different kinds of maps on different kinds of messages. Let me also kind of uh, show you, the, uh, so this, this is the last run that we did. So it seems that the EDI inbound uh, flow ran, and then it called an HTTP endpoint in the end, and that caused this particular flow to trigger as well, as we would have expected. Um, let's look at, uh, we've seen uh, transform earlier. Uh, let's look at the output of uh, validate. and. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, looks like my validation actually failed out here. Uh, right. Uh, okay. This things happens in demo, right? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, but you can get the, uh, what I was hoping to show was that uh, the output of validate actually includes the type of the message, uh, the root namespace, and the, uh, uh, the, the name of the schema. Uh, so that you can then uh, get that output out in a, in a, in a logic app uh, and then use it for, say, conditional-based routing using the same conditions that Stephen talked about uh, a little while ago. Right. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the shot about uh, the wetter pipeline components that we have. Uh, moving on, uh, one of the new pieces that we have shipped uh, three weeks ago or two weeks ago um, is a rule engine that sits in the cloud. Uh, this rule engine is able to, uh, you know, uh, process XML data, and uh, I'm gonna, you know, give you a brief overview of how that works. So, uh, rule engines are pretty, pretty, pretty good in terms of being, uh, in terms of allowing you to decouple your uh, business policy from the actual workflow definition itself, right? and uh, you don't have to kind of keep driving your workflow to um, uh, match with the new business policy if you're able to do that. Um, the way we've uh, worked on this and shipped it out is that it uh, hopefully enables uh, business analysts to kind of come and define rules in a way that it's, uh, it's more natural to them, uh, using a vocabulary that uh, developers would define and then uh, define, uh, using conditions and actions as a part of the rule. Uh, <clears throat> And that's, that's great for you guys because once business decides to change a policy, uh, the amount of effort that goes into uh, rolling out a change to it uh, doesn't require you to uh, go through an entire dev cycle, but it's a configuration-based change on the rules engine, uh, on the rules API app, uh, and you don't need to kind of go have the entire cycle run through it. Um, let's kind of uh, review a few of the concepts and uh, look at the rules engine in portal as well. Um, the first of the concept that I talked about is a vocabulary uh, that you would generally have a developer create. You know, it's really just a, a, a friendly name for uh, developer objects 
So uh, you might have, uh, like uh, in an XML, you might have like, several fields, and the developer could pick and choose which are the ones that he wants to expose to the business analyst uh, to be able to go write the rules and define friendly names for this. So uh, something like you know insurance claim schema slash controlso slash yada 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 slash customer name uh, becomes simply customer name, which your BA would understand a lot better, um, and that makes the rules much easier to author, right? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Next is uh, the rules themselves. So the rules themselves are constructed as uh, condition action constructs that govern the business logic. Um, and they use the uh, vocabulary that's uh, defined by the uh, developer. So let me at this point kind of switch back to the portal and actually show you how that works. Uh, that's my rules service there. And um, you know the familiar blade of uh, uh, an API app comes up. It's got like the various standard components uh, and the uh, vocabulary definitions and the policies uh, along with it. So as you can see, I have 12 uh, vocabulary definitions already created uh, that was being used as a part of my demo. And I have a single root policy. We at this point support uh, two types of um, two types of uh, 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 vocabulary definitions. Uh, one is uh, basically XML-based. So um, what I did is I took the rule schema and uploaded it to the rule engine, and it discovered all of these uh, objects inside my XML schema and made these available. So you can see that uh, there's root and this product along with their expats uh, on the right-hand side on what's gotten exposed. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we allow you to go define um, the uh, lit, uh, constant values as well. So uh, what we're doing in this particular rule is, uh, based on the order value, uh, we are uh, taking a look at the uh, slab of the order and applying a 10% or a 20% or a 30% discount uh, on top of it, uh, which I will show you uh, in, the, in the rule policy. So um, let's just quickly see how uh, definitions work. Um, you can go define demo definition. Um, I can choose whether it's an XML or uh, literal. If I choose XML, it's going to ask me which particular scheme is it from. Uh, I could choose literal, though, and give it uh, a literal name and uh, create my rule. So, um, Let's look at the rules themselves now. Um, you can see that I have a rule policy called compute price, and uh, that's got several uh, rules uh, defined in it, five of them. Um, and uh, <coughs> oh, basically, uh, these rules execute in this particular sequence. So the first step I'm doing is computing the basic price of the rule. Uh, you can see a preview of what I'm doing. Uh, if true, then basic price equals unit into quantity, um, and then I have to update the basic price so that the rule kind of runs uh, on the updated value of basic price. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have a no discount that checks for uh, less than 1,000, so no discount is applicable, you, you're done with the policy, um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, let's actually look into one of these uh, rule instances. Uh, you can give it a friendly name and a description. And uh, as I said, you know, it's a rule is basically a composition of a uh, condition and a bunch of actions that go along with it. Um, you can, uh, the, the way you type out the conditions is very uh, in, uh, more, more like English as opposed to a programming language. Um, and uh, we have IntelliSense support out there. Um, so let me kind of go do a, a slight modification to this rule and say, let's say in this particular case, I want to add uh, a tax value to this. Uh, so I would say equals, as you can see, all of my operators kind of show up in a drop down uh, with IntelliSense. And uh, this is my discount price. If you say, let's put a 12% uh, on top of it as tax, right? Um, and I can save this particular rule and it does the validation of it and make sure that everything's okay. Now the rule successfully saved, and I have the update uh, out here, right? Uh, once you make an update to a rule policy like this, it's immediately applicable. 
Uh, and instead of having to run the entire workflow to figure out uh, how that runs, you can actually uh, use a pretty cool feature called test, uh, which allows you to test the policy. It shows up all the relevant uh, values for that particular group. Um, and so let's say that I'm going to pick a quantity of 100 and the basic price of 200 out here. And I can simply run the test. So uh, what what the UI is doing at this point is it's basically constructing the XML uh, based on schema that it has uh, and sending it out to the rule engine and then running the entire rule and you can just see uh, how the rule ran, what were the weight values that got computed as a part of the execution of the policy make tweaks and come back here and do really quick uh, iterations of, you know, fixing your uh, rule definition and testing it out. Uh, if things are not going right, uh, we let you dig into the actual execution of the rule as well. So you can then uh, open up the log of the rule execution uh, and see how things went, what conditions were evaluated, how were they evaluated, and, you know, did you have an issue because there was an ordering issue of the rule policies that you have, or was it because of something you put in the internet? Right. So, um, so that's the fundamental building block of rule policies. You have a uh, bunch uh, of rules that we just saw. And all of these can be put together into a single policy uh, that can be executed via an API. Um, that's what uh, the orchestration is doing right now. So I put together my price computation rules in one policy. And in the orchestration, uh, in the large gap, I'm calling the rule engine and saying execute the uh, price computation policy, uh, and that's, that's what's running. So, um, uh, with that, you know, uh, let's kind of quickly recap about what we just saw. Uh, we talked about how uh, API apps make a great platform for us to build connectors and pipeline components, and as well as for you guys, which are hoping that you know, uh, we do write a lot of uh, components that uh, make sense in the integration space. And Logic App provides a great platform for us to do orchestrations and mediation uh, while providing the key functionality of being able to track the data uh, that goes in and out uh, of the entire orchestration, uh, along with the debugging capability and insights into what happened at various steps. So uh, we just saw that you know, you've got um, the ability to connect to a wide array of data sources. Um, that's what uh, we, we are shipping with the current release. Uh, there's XML, flat file mediation, uh, and then routing you can do uh, based on the conditions uh, constructs that Logic Apps provides. Um, EDI data uh, can be handled uh, in a way similar to how Azure BizTalk services provided. And, um, Similarly, uh, we also have hybrid connectivity that you know, Karan also talked about earlier as being key to our scenarios with a lot of our connectors being able to use a service bus uh, connection to go on-premise and talk to, say, SAP or SQL or Oracle uh, that's sitting on-premise. So that pretty much kind of covers the set of functionality that we had with uh, BizTalk Services 1.0. Uh, so what we have now is uh, not just that and a bunch of more, right? Uh, we've got the ability to extend to uh, uh, various connectors and pipelines. Uh, uh, we saw Stephen demonstrate uh, Twitter with OAuth support. Um, we can hopefully monetize this in a marketplace uh, pretty soon. Um, the workflow engine now kind of supports JSON um, uh, natively, and so you can do a lot, of, lot more with JSON data. And uh, we would have pre-baked integration recipes uh, soon, which you can use uh, in your flow, uh, and you don't have to go and go create those from scratch, or you can build your own for reuse uh, within of your enterprise. Um, and we would have support for long-running workflows uh, based on uh, uh, HTTP 202 pattern, and uh, we just saw the business rules engine, right? So, um, in short of it, uh, the new uh, app services platform provides like a ton of more functionality than what we had. And uh, what you saw running today is not on any pre, uh, you know, bits that we have uh, hosted separately. It's running on production Azure. So the set of uh, the demo, the demos that you saw for Edifact, for you know, being able to run a rule engine, for being able to transform that data, push it into SQL, uh, is actually running on production in Azure. So you can go try this out today.
Yep, that's, that's about it. Thanks, guys.